so welcome everyone to our second news from the frontline meeting um the first the one that we did uh, a, um a while ago was um definitely a shot in the arm of inspiration i think for all of us um because wherever there's fights happening by workers we know that there is hope that things can change and i'm sure that tonight is going to be the same uh, my name is holly rigby i am a, a secondary school teacher and um national education union activist um, and we have an amazing lineup of striking workers today from all kinds of disputes, Great Ormond Street, B&Q, um, London Underground and, and many more. Um, and this is a really important meeting that we're having. Um, in 2021, we did see an uptick in, in strike action um, in the, in the um, uh, fallout of the, of the pandemic uh, with workers starting to stand up to bosses, particularly over fire and rehire. Um, fighting for better pay and to outsourcing. Uh, but we are starting um, 2022 in, um, let's be frank, a difficult um, place for working people as we're now seeing the cost of living crisis hit Britain hard. Um, we've got doubling energy prices. I I'm sure like, um, like many of you have been following on Twitter, seeing these crazy energy bills that people are posting now that they, um, with the massive increases in energy and, and how difficult it would be people to pay for this crisis, um, having to make um, decisions no one should have to between um, heating their homes and, and feeding their families. Um, we've got national insurance hikes and soaring inflation on top of that and uh, pay, obviously our pay is not increasing in line with all of this. Um, but at the same time, M's, MPs pay is going up by £2,000 um, this year. Shell has announced its highest profits in eight years, despite charging us huge rates um, for our energy. Um, and while they are getting wealthier, um, everybody else's um, living um, standards are uh, declining rapidly. Um, and this is also in the middle of a massive crisis, I would say, for Boris Johnson's government over the various different um, uh, party gates and lies that were clearly told to the public when everybody else was making sacrifices about um, the shenanigans happening in number 10. Um, but I don't know about you, I don't really want Boris Johnson just to be manoeuvred out of office by a series of um, photographs from Dominic Cummings' iPhone. Actually, I think he needs to be forced from office, um, from energy, from the, from the streets and from strikes as well. Um, and we have some of the people leading these uh, struggles with us here tonight, which is amazing to have such a great array of workers um, taking action everywhere. And we've really organised this meeting um, because it's important to link together these strikes and these fight backs to build this solidarity between workers. Because if we're going to escalate the situation in the country nationally, we need to think about how all of our struggles are linked up and what we can learn from each other in terms of um, yeah, taking this fight really to, um, to the bosses and to the government. Uh, so um, we uh, just to start off with, um, it's nice to start with a, um, a success of a struggle that we just had news of. So um, Tracy Scholes, who was a bus, who is a bus driver in Manchester, um, lost her job and there was a huge campaign to get her reinstated. Uh, she was one of the first female bus drivers in that depot had worked there for 35 years and uh, we were uh, delighted to see today that she has been reinstated and that campaign has been successful so it just shows the power of when we take action collectively and I know that um, there's lots of people on the call tonight who are going to explain how their action is really standing up to um, unfair um, pay and unfair conditions. Um, okay, so just a bit of uh, housekeeping to start us off with. Um, we are going to be recording the meeting. Um, we're just recording the speakers, so don't worry about um, in the Q&A. Uh, we will have a Q&A for about 15 minutes after um, our speakers finish, um, where you can make um, general questions and comments. Um, and yeah, that's all the housekeeping things that we need to know. So um, our speakers are going to have um, about four minutes each. And uh, we are starting today kicking off of a wonderful lineup with um, Pat McGrath, who is um, a B&Q worker, has been on strike, I think, um, Pat, for 10 weeks, which is amazing. Um, and they are voting on a pay offer coming up very soon. There's been huge support, big picket lines. Um, so we are delighted to have Pat here and he's going to kick us off tonight to tell us about um, what B&Q workers have been up to. Um, so. Pat, you're unmuted. Perfect. Hi, everybody. Uh, I'll keep it brief. Uh, we're actually in our 11th week of industrial action. Uh, 
we had no response from the company, a company which made record profits. Uh, it's Kingfisher Stroke B and Q. Uh, we're third party to Wincanton, uh, but we knew we were having an impact on the stores. The retired members, community members, Socialist Workers Party, uh, they've been out demoing in the stores, they're hurting the corporate image and sending us photos from across the UK. So uh, they were only short on stock what we supply. So we got called to a meeting last Tuesday uh, and we put it to ballot. The company's offered uh, 6.75. Uh, backdated across the board. We stipulated because uh, it sent all members a letter stating that they wouldn't be accruing holidays and uh, back pay whilst they're on strike. But we said one of the most insulting things would be that uh, the colleagues what have worked, uh, scabs as we call them, uh, <laughs> pretty politely, uh, receiving more back pay. So we secured that, which is around another extra £250. And then what the members wanted was a recognition payment for working through COVID. Uh, we're the only site to achieve that. Uh, so we'll get the result of the ballot Friday evening, but the offer is 6.75, uh, 250 pound recognition payment and back pay, which equates to about another 2.5%. So uh, we could say that it evaluates uh, to 11.75 if we wanted to be inventive. Uh, but all the other sites now are tied up on a two-year deal, uh, with 4% being uh, what, what they've all agreed to. We wouldn't agree to that. We said we'll either have RPI or 4% as a benchmark, and they, wouldn't, well, they didn't want to agree to that. So uh, we stand alone again this year. But I said to Holly uh, the other day, you know, this is not a male-dominant site. You know, we've got maybe 35 39% uh female staff and about six or seven where english is not their first spoken language so it's nice to see you know the solidarity the relationships built on the picket line you know it's a big site we've got around 450 uh, members out on strike so uh according to sharon graham you know we've got a strike fund uh you know which we've utilized so uh i don't want to go over my time if anybody's got any quick questions Great. Thanks, Pat. And um, it's really powerful the story you tell about the fact that um, where your site fought back, you're now getting this like much bigger increase in paying workers. It's such a good evidence, isn't it, of like what that resistance looks like. Um, and yes, I, I yeah, I hope all, all the best for getting that. What is 11.75 percent? We're calling it. I think that I think that's that I, I think that's definitely um, yeah, I, big, big up your big up your package because that sounds yeah. great to me. In a warehouse environment, you know, it, it's quite good. Uh, yeah. So uh, yeah, I'm optimistic that the result you know should be in favour of acceptance. You know, the union's recommended acceptance, and we'll start again. Anniversary dates the first of July. Yeah, and I reiterate that we're the only site now on the contract. Scotland, Doncaster, Swindon, Haywood, you know, they're all tied now at four percent for this year. So if inflation is you know eight percent, ten percent, and who knows, then uh, RPI will be our you know will be our indicator. Uh, but yeah, it's been uh, it's been a long haul. I didn't think the company would leave us out you know ten weeks without speaking to us, and then they actually wanted us back the following day. You know, they were that desperate to, uh, we know the contract manager's lost his job. Uh, he's departed of the business and they've got a new one in. Uh, so, yeah, it, it shows that standing together, uh, you know, you do get success. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, and we're going up hopefully to uh, Scunthorpe to support the scaffolders at Activo uh, on Friday. I don't know if Dave's on here, but uh, yeah, I, but I don't want to, I don't want to go on mid-time, but uh, that's, that's it in a short uh, mm -hmm. A short period of time. Yeah, brilliant. And I think you've made the point really clearly about um, why meetings like this are important because it's a great win for you. And it sounds like there's been a lot of organising over over the period of ten weeks. But there are workers everywhere who are not, you know, who who don't have that um, that rise to to match the cost of living. So your experience is, Pat, I think, is so important, and it's you know why we're doing the meeting tonight. So um, yeah, thank you so much. Thank you so much for sharing and, and kicking it off, and and well done on all the work you've done so far. Um, we're going to go to our next speaker.
um, which her, who is um, Sherelle Cadigan, who um, is uh, an, uh, working with Aslef. Um, she is the BAME rep for um, the London District um, and is also the editor of a newsletter called uh, No Justice, No Trains, which is amazing. And um, hopefully Sherelle can tell us a little bit about that as well. So uh, Sherelle, um, hopefully... Either. Yeah, good evening, everyone. Hi, thank you, Holly. Um, and solidarity with um, Pat. Ten weeks is um, long going. So, yeah, solidarity with Pat to you guys at BQ. Um, so, yep, yeah, I'm the representative for London Underground. And I've worked for London Underground for about 20 years. And over that time, I can testify that there's not one thing that we have that has been voluntarily given to us our pay our working conditions have been tirelessly fought for and you know we've gone out on strike for it and um like what holly said you know we've got the monthly newsletter no justice no trains and, and we mean it um firstly as a fellow transport worker i'd like to congratulate tracy skulls on her recent victory um that was won um through appeal you know, it is a win, of course, do you know what I mean? But to go through an appeal, I know exactly what, that, what that's like because I had to do the same thing. And, you know, we can't put aside the depth that these companies will go to and the contemptuous way that they will treat workers, even workers like Tracy with 35 years, um, you know, going through that and being targeted by your bosses is something that I can completely understand because I went through it. Um, just to put that in context, in June 2020, at the height of the global Black Lives Matter protests, following the police murder of George Floyd, I challenged someone who abused their authority, a racist manager who spewed their hatred for my community. And what happened next? It, it wasn't uh, sadly a surprise. You know, management closed ranks and attempted to rid me of my livelihood, basically, for my stand against racism. So what they thought would happen, and I think that, you know, when they're strong arming um, in, uh, staff, and that's in any company, I think they feel like we're going to go away quietly. We're going to uh, cower and be fearful of the fight ahead. And um, one of my, one of the most inspiring women that I, I a woman that I, I'm really inspired by, Rosa Parks, she um, said, I have learned over the years that when one's mind is made up, this diminishes fear knowing what must be done diminishes fear. And I knew what I had to do. I stood my ground. Thankfully, the whole of Aslef Union backed me with a petition of over 10,000 supporters and Solidarity won and my name was cleared. There's so much strength in Solidarity, mm -hmm. um, especially for me and my TFL colleagues at the minute with the TFL funding crisis. Um, which the government for a series of conditions attached to bailouts, their aim is to attack our jobs, our terms, our conditions and um, pensions. And unfortunately, you know, we, we can't as staff, we can't afford to rely on anyone, not the mayor, not the commissioner, who we know, you know, ultimately they will look at staff to make sacrifices. We have to, we've got strength in numbers, we have to organise, we have to link up as workers across the unions. Currently, ASLEF has a live mandate where 98.8% of my London underground train operator ASLEF members voted in favour of strike action. That's 98.98%. This is a clear message to our employers that we're not prepared to accept them slashing our staff pensions and tearing up um, hard fought for agreed working conditions. Um, and just the other day, just in November, we used that live mandate. When the company had plans to punish the sick, their aim was to replace the current attendance at work procedure, um, replace it with an even more punitive one. Instead of the maximum length warning of 26 weeks, they wanted to lengthen it to 52 weeks with no right of appeal or presentation. So no matter what happened to you, cold, you break your leg, whatever it was, COVID, you just got a straight 52 two weeks warning and you had no right of appeal or representation and because of that live mandate as a third notice of industrial action to the company and there was a quick turnaround the, the company soon backed down and that is the strength of 
our the solidarity of our members. The pandemic, unfortunately, is also for this government an excuse to put a squeeze on TFL financially and squeeze all the sectors that we work in, education, NHS, housing, everything. You know, and as the cost of living rises, this crisis hurts us all. And it, it hurts the poorest the hardest. And I believe, I think we should all believe that we have a duty and a responsibility as trade unionists to unite and organise and fight it where it hurts at the heart of the matter, which is Boris Johnson's Tory government. And, you know, Martin Luther King Jr. said, injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. So we have to stand firm, don't back down and just be, just show that solidarity across the board. So thank you. Thank you, Holly. Thank you everyone for listening. Thanks so much, Sherelle. Um, and yeah, I should have said to uh, Pat as well that you would be able to hear like applause going for you if we were if we were in a room together. Um, I, you, you so powerfully drew the links between the role of the union defending working conditions, but also that political role that the union can play, challenging racism, involved in movements like Black Lives Matter. Like we're trade unionists, but we're political activists as well. And the fact that you were targeted for that is like is disgraceful. And it just shows that that individual attack on you, the solidarity can can fight back against it. And I'm so glad that the union stood with you on that because I can imagine those those individual attacks. You know, they they bite hard. Having been through it myself as well, so. So yeah, I thank you so much for drawing both out, um, both out together. Um, thank you. Okay, so um, we uh, we're just keeping rolling tonight. Just 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 one on to the next. Um, so next up, we uh, slight change in running order. Just um, I hope don't mind. I think Gary knows that he's about to come next now. Um, because we're just waiting for someone else to come into the meeting. So we have Gary Walker up next, who um, is uh, from Czech in Trafford in Manchester. They are seeking an above in inflation uh, pay rise as uh, they well deserve. And uh, I think I'm right in saying that Gary is in his 10th week of strike action. So we've got some serious uh, long time uh, strikers in, in this meeting tonight, which is great to see. Is, is Gary there? Yeah, I am, yeah. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. I can't see you, but maybe you will appear. Um, there you go. Yes, we yeah. can see you now. Hi, Gary. Yeah. yeah hi. Yeah. Um, yeah. I was interested in listening to Patrick speak then because, like I said, we're we're, we're pretty even on the um, the amount of weeks that we have been striking. We're, we're up to our week ten now, and we, we we've done the reballot, which will be coming through. We should get the results about three o'clock tomorrow to extend for another 12 weeks. Um, so the, we're at a bit of a stalemate with the company currently. Um, the, the company that we work for is uh, Czech UK, which is part of the Brambles Group, which is a, a multinational pallet company that, that you know not many people may have heard of, but they're absolutely huge and they supply all your major chains, your supermarkets, your bean queues with pallets. And um, like I said, they're absolutely huge and they're making a hell of a lot of money. Um, the, the, the offer that they offered us was 2%. Um, and that's been pretty much the norm since I've worked there. Um, I think the only time we've ever gone above that, well, we actually, we've actually had less, but the only time we've actually gone above that was we actually paid for our own pay rise by increasing, by, uh, increasing production basically us doing more. So uh, each year it's just been stagnating at 1.52%. And uh, this year, we've well, we've worked right the way through COVID. We've been classed as key workers. They've banged the drum that we're key workers. They've told us how important we are to the supply chain. We've kept the country moving through the pandemic. Um, but that's just not reflected in ultimately in the in the pay offer. Um, we were told last year that we was living in uncertain times, and it was almost used as um, as a tactic to get us to off to, to accept the derives we offer last year. And this year we were sort of led to believe that there'd be something better on the table, and it just didn't come. Um, so it, it, it sort of coming it's. it's Took us a long time to get in. Uh, sort of the end of a, of a long road, really, which has coincided with 
COVID. Now we've got the cost of living crisis as well, which is it's just getting worse and worse and worse. And, and people just had enough. Literally, I've had enough. And they've had enough of this uh, corrupt, is the only word I can use, conservative government. Um, the only problem is, is we, we do feel abandoned a little bit by the Labour Party. So where we go forward from there, uh, I haven't got, we haven't got the I haven't got the answers to that. God knows, but it's uh, it, we're at we're at a stage now where people've just had enough, and I've noticed that there is a, there is an uh, there is an upturn, and there is there is people now making a stand, and it, it it's got to a point now where we just can't continue as we are. Um, you know the the money that we earn for the for the work that we do. Like I said, we we, we don't think that we're moving in line to the point where you can sustain just just the normal life, just to just to live and work in the surrounding area where we where we work. We work in Trafford Park, which is just a few miles away from Manchester City Centre, and to just live and work in that surrounding area with, with the cost of living and don't see how it's sustainable for, for you know for, for younger people in particular that just want to just want to get a, you know get a foothold in life and you know and earning that doing hard days work and just have a you know a good standard of living. So it, it's it's just the times come now where it, you know where it, it it needs to spread it needs to go national and people just need need to start standing up and and fighting because if we don't we, who knows where where this road leads. So, as I said, we're coming up to the morning week 11 next week. Um, the company wants to meet us on the 16th of February. Um, the offer originally was 2%. Um, and to be perfectly honest, after speaking to Patrick in that, I, I, it's actually because these lads on our picket don't think what we're willing to settle is enough. And after listening to Patrick there, I'm going to be actually going back to the picket in the morning and, and I'm going to be telling him that, you know, the, the, we're willing to settle on 5% now. Um, we've told the uh, company that 5% back dated to our anniversary date of the 1st of July and you get us back in work. But even on 5%, it's for the money that the company's making, which like I said is a lot, um, they've actually they've actually boomed through COVID. They've not um, they dangled, but they came up with the idea that oh, you know, we're in uncertain times and stuff like that. But they've actually boomed. They've actually done as done as well as ever. So um, we're now there's certain people on that picket now are now looking at five percent and thinking, hang on a minute, is you know, is that enough? So. Um, Basically, that's pretty much where we're at. And like I said, hopefully we get it resolved next week. I mean, that, me personally, I don't think we will. Um, you know, the, the comments at the beginning from the bosses were we were going to last a month. We're now 10 weeks in. We're balloted. We, we, we're unanimous. I think the, the, the actual ballot came in at 78% for the strike action. Um, some people didn't get to vote. Um, and I'm pretty pretty certain now when we get the results of the ballot tomorrow, it'll have gone up way way into the late eighties, way into the late eighties. Brilliant, yeah. And um, I mean, obviously, the point of this meeting is to try and connect up workers in different struggles and like hearing, you know, Pat's like massive eleven point five percent. It is like the idea is to say like we deserve this and you know the work that you're doing like providing pallets it's so interesting because there's all these jobs that are essential to basically keeping the country fed that you know most people might not even see but you've been working like tirelessly through the pandemic and yeah you know, yeah rise you know and especially if they're making all this money like it's just outrageous to say because your production increases that's the only way you get a pay rise like you should also get a pay rise because of that so i really yeah. And it, 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 it's really important that what you say about the pallets because, you know, people, and, and, and one of our officers said the same thing. I think people don't quite realise how important to the supply chain we have been through COVID. That, mm -hmm. and, and the company, 
they, they, they banged the drum on that. They, 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 they really, they obviously wanted us working through the pandemic. And at the beginning of the pandemic, none of us knew, you know, you know, there, there was a lot of fear in the air. Nobody knew people were going into work. We was constantly wipe, wiping our workstations down. We was having to wear masks. Nobody, you know, there was a lot of fear running through the band and uh, they, they, they played on that and, 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 you know, they bigged us up about how important we was. And then, like I said, they've offered us 2%. It, it wasn't even 2% when it first came. The first offer that came on the table was about 1.8. So, you know, I actually sat down with a, uh, a supply supply chain director a couple of weeks ago and I actually looked him across the, in the eye across the table and said, do you think 2%'s fair? And he actually said, yeah, I do. And I was just like, you know, you know, there's no talking to these people. This is a global, global giant on a massive, huge scale. And, you know, you look into the, the people that are involved with this company, you know, you've got your absolute massive financial giants that are your large shareholders. And, you know, we all know the names of the people who they are and, and you just don't seem to just to grasp it or just want to share any of that profit at all yeah absolutely and, and that's the point isn't it you're not going to get those wins by kind of asking nicely because they just have no sense what life is like for people at the moment and the work that you've put in to build those profits so that's you know it's why why we why we don't ask gently and why you've been on strike for 10 weeks because yeah. that is the power that we have like as workers to say no, you're wrong. Like, I don't care whether you think 2% is fair. It's not fair. We're saying it's not fair. We deserve better. We're key workers. And uh, yeah, all power to you. I, I hope that I really do hope the strike goes well because um, yeah, 10 weeks is um, it's, it's a decent strike. I think, um, uh, yeah, Shabir's put the link for your strike fund into the chat. So um, if people do want to contribute to that strike fund, but um, thank you so much, Gary. Um, Excellent. For for your contribution. Um, we are gonna go next to um, Omar, um, who is the um, a UBW um, security guard um, at Great Ormond Street Hospital. Um, they are outsourced from the hospital and are fighting to be bought in house, um, have been on strike for six weeks. I did see some amazing photos of this picket on social media um, in the last few days, including um, our guy, Jeremy Corbyn, um, coming to support as well. So um, I'm really excited to hear from, from Omar um, about, mm -hmm. the, yeah, about your struggle and yeah, giving us some inspiration. Yeah, sure. Um, hi, guys. Uh, first of all, thank you for having me. It's been quite inspiring um, hearing everybody's stories and what, what they're doing to um, to basically get what, what they deserve. And uh, we're trying to achieve the same at Great Ormond Street Hospital. Um, currently, we're outsourced to a company called Carlisle, uh, which is owned by Lord Ashcroft. Um, I don't know if you guys heard of him, but he's been in the news um he's uh for tax evasion and basically you know all of the corrupt activities um and it kind of shows in, in in the way carlisle is managing and uh perceiving our picket line at the minute uh the the reason uh also why we're picketing is because we want to be bought in-house uh we we want the same pay as our nhs colleagues uh last year when um uh, pandemic was, was at what is that was at its peak uh, the NHS announced 3% uh, pay rise and some other benefits. Uh, when we asked um, our company to, to give us something, basically, if it's not 3% or um, all of the benefits that NHS workers are getting, but give us something, uh, they, they simply refused. Uh, this is a company which has 65 million pounds in revenue every year, um, and uh, they, they can't spare some money for, for their work. I've been working through the pandemic, um, taking on job roles from um, other workers such as um, the porters because they were off sick um, but they haven't got anything to worry about as they're in-house um, so there is a um, discrimination going on um, we also don't have maternity leave for women uh, we have a uh, a lady Erika uh, she's pregnant at the minute and she's not going to get any maternity leave which I think is disgusting uh, they, they should they should give her something uh, so she's able to support herself uh, when when she will be off. So the, the, so every everyone basically um, has their own reasons, uh, and collectively, uh, our main reason is to basically be brought in house. 
um, so we can basically get can so we basically get all, all the benefits that our other colleagues are getting um, and uh, yeah uh, that's that's pretty much it sorry I'm not really good with um with speeches but yeah if there are any questions I'm willing to answer that um, well here's your virtual round of applause <laughs> thank you you, you explained that very well I mean you saw my kind of George, you may have seen my jaw dropping when you were speaking, to be honest, Omar, because, um, yeah, I mean, like you're working within, you are working within the NHS, you are keeping Great Ormond Street Hospital running and yet are not afforded the same, you know, um, rights and conditions as the other workers. Um, you know, even the NHS staff, 3% pay rise isn't enough for them. So the fact you're not even yes. getting that is just outrageous. Um, it, and, it really is. Yeah. Uh, so sorry, sorry to um, interrupt you. <laughs> Um, uh, the thing is that Carlisle and Gosh, they, they just don't want to come on the negotiating table because uh, they have maybe once or twice, but um, the, their demands have just been ridiculous. It's, it's totally nothing what we want. Um, lately, they've served UVW Union uh, with an, a legal notice to stop picketing. Uh, and they've, they've also said that they will be um, doing legal proceedings against the UVW Union if they don't. Uh, minimize the number of, of the people that go to a picket to six only, uh, which is outrageous. So UVW is not having that. We're not having that. Uh, we'll go to any lengths to basically uh, prove them wrong and show that, you know, we deserve better and uh, we're no less than anybody else. Absolutely. And yeah, I mean, the fact that they're threatening legal actions shows that you have them scared. And, you know, I yes. know had like big support on those picket lines as as you should do and you know the movement is behind you and is with you um and it will be the thing that helps you to fight off any of these like nonsense um yeah legal threats and things um because yeah i mean it's similar to what we we're saying about the pallet workers you know the job that you do it's not necessarily what we might think of when we think of the nhs but it, like it, you wouldn't be able to run these hospitals without the work that you do and <laughs> You deserve that recognition and the pay and yeah all of the yeah and and maternity leave it is it is true like i thought it was illegal not to allow someone like any maternity sorry i'm just like gobsmacked by that there's she shows that yeah. you no maternity leave i think i think she gets like 12 point something percent of however many hours she's worked in a fiscal year uh so if let's say if you've done i don't know five six hundred hours worth of work you only get paid 12 point something percent of that so she'll get paid some money in the first month, but after that, there is no hope. Yeah. Like, but they, it's just in her in her contract that uh, they won't honor that. So yeah. it's, it's quite outrageous. She's quite upset about that, and uh, it's one of the issues that uh, we have also raised to uh, to bring in maternity leave, proper maternity leave. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, um, good on you. I know that I'm sure, um, yeah, that people will be getting down to your picket line to keep going and keep um, keep them rattled. Um, Lord Ashcroft, wherever he is, avoiding tax. Yeah. Um, yeah, well done, Omar, and keep going. Thank you. you know, lots of people with you, and it's, a, it's an important cause. Um, okay, so uh, next up, we have got Martin Norfolk. Um, uh, previously advertised was um, David um, from the Scaffolders, um, but he has sent his apologies. To be fair to David, he is actually like, um, I think kind of like on a flying picket in Scotland somewhere, going to other Scaffolders like around the country. So um, he is in other, otherwise engaged in, in kind of organizing. Um, but we have Martin here instead, who we're delighted to have, um, who is the former rep for the scaffolders. Um, they are on a mammoth um, 15, uh, 15 week strike. Um, so yeah, um, we had Dave here on the, last, um, on the last call when the strike was ongoing then. So it just shows um, how much they are, yeah, how long it's been going on for, but now the fact that um, the scaffolders, that I think they're really um, taking this fight across across the country. Um, so we are delighted to have Martin. So Martin, are you are you there? Uh, yeah, I'm here. Great. Um, yeah, so we've been on strike now for 15 weeks. Um, to be fair, there's, there's a bit of a reprisal on the um, determination of the guys. Um, We've had a few responses from Actido. We officially finished our first bout of strike action on the 27th of December. Um, we were due to return to work on the 4th of January um, for approximately two weeks while the reballot was was happening. Um, we was basically locked out from British Steel in Scunthorpe. Uh, they told us there was no work for us. 
Um, but other companies are doing our work. Um, the ballot went ahead. It was voted unanimously of 86% for further strike action. Um, we've basically been um, treated like scum by British Steel. Um, Activo itself has agreed to pay us our demands, but British Steel are basically saying to Activo, get off site. We don't want you. We don't want the scaffolders. We've got other companies, Brand, PMC, um, Rope Access Trade Solutions, doing our work for us. We picketed on Monday at High Peak in Derbyshire. They've agreed to pull their scaffolders off site. We went to Lindsay Ore Refinery uh, near Inningham the Monday before. They re removed their scaffolders from site. Uh, there's just no discussions going on. Basically, we're blocked out. They don't want us back. And we're now fighting not only Activo, but British Steel to try and resolve this issue. So it's, it's, it's really awkward. We've had fantastic support from uh, other areas. We had £36,000 donated from Denmark, um, scaffolders, into our strike fund. Uh, we're currently able then to give some guys a little bit of a financial support. Um, we're getting the, a great response from Unite. They're backing us all the way. Um, but at the end of the day, without British Steel sitting down and talking, we've got no hope. And that's where we are at the moment. And Dave and Dane, the two shop stewards, are out at uh, Grangemouth in Scotland, picketing another active site. You've got to remember that Dennis O'Brien, the second richest man in Ireland, could settle this dispute tomorrow, but refuses to talk to us. Uh, we've had guys go to Celtic football ground. We've got the Celtic footballers, uh, sorry, Celtic football fans, supporting us. We've got many, many supports. We're doing a, a day of action on the 22nd of this month. We've had fantastic support from the communities. Um, we've also had, um, when we've been doing um, a day of action at British Steel, drivers literally driving into us. Um, we've had one guy hit twice by a car. The police have turned up, and to be fair to them, they've been great. You know, they've not removed the barriers that we've put there, but they're not actually active in, in sorting out the issues. You know, we're filmed every day by British Steel, but there's some reason they don't seem to be able to film any action by their employees against us. Um, we're going to carry on. We're not going to stop. We're going to keep going. Thank you. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Martin. And wow, international solidarity as well. Thirty-six thousand pounds. That's that's a that's a decent sum into the strike fund, which I'm I'm glad to hear, given that it has been um, fifteen weeks. Um, and also just how much um, the, the 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 strike has been escalated into Scotland. You know that is that's how you get the richest or second richest man in Ireland scared, isn't it? Is by is by linking up workers across these different sites so that they can't just lock you out. So um, it's a really inspiring ongoing dispute, and um, yeah, hoping hoping for a good outcome. Um, we are gonna I'm gonna keep um, rolling uh, next to our. Our final striker, um, who is uh, Michael um, Lavalette, who is from UCU at Liverpool Hope University, has been on strike. I think further strike action is um, starting next week. Um, so, Michael, if you are there, could you? Oh, uh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I am. So, um, hi, everybody. Uh, thanks for the invite. Um, I was going to start off by saying that I'm coming to talk about the long running uh, UCU dispute, but when I've heard some of the other uh, strikers this evening talking about 10, 11 and 15 week strikes, um, it maybe puts ours into context. Um, I've not got so long, but what I'd like to do is, is try and put a little bit of background into the ongoing uh, strike uh, across the university sector in Britain. And I want to do that really uh, by, by making three clear, uh, three, three points. And the first one is to try and put it in some sort of longer term context. So some people might think that university workers are, are a relatively privileged bunch. They have long summer holidays. They um, perhaps are very well paid um, and they you know sit around 
drinking cups of tea and, and writing books and thinking that's what they, uh, maybe the stereotype would be uh, like. Uh, the reality is really quite different from that. Uh, over the last 20 to 30 years, uh, I think that the higher education sector has been one of the sectors where the processes of marketization and privatization have been at their most intense. And one of the outcomes of that has been to fundamentally change the job that we do as university workers. If I can give you just a little example from my own experience, I've been working in this sector for over 30 years. And 30 years ago, when I started off, I would have a, a seminar, a, a small group with, with students. And my first university was at Paisley College at the time and, and had 10 uh, students working with me, working around the, 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 the reading that they've been given. I then moved to Aberdeen University and it dropped. I had a class of eight. And then in 1992, I moved to Preston to the University of Central Lancashire. And in my first morning, I turned up at the new job and the head of my section said, uh, you've got a seminar to take. So this small group, do you want me to go and introduce you? I said, no, no, it's OK. I've, I've done this before. And I went into this class and I didn't have eight or 10. There was 35 students in the class. There weren't enough seats for them uh, to sit down on. And I suddenly was confronted with the, the, the consequences of the rapid privatisation and marketization of, of, of universities. And it's really gone a pace since then. Um, it's gone in various different ways, but one of the most significant ways in England is that we are the only country in the world in England where the entire cost of education is borne by the students. So students have to pay £9,250 fees. The state pays nothing towards the education of those young people. And the universities, to counteract that or to try and make money out of that, try to encourage as many students to come to their university compared to the university down the road. So it's, a, a, it's a, a, a sector of very, very rapid competition. And what the government have done is that just like in schools, our work is regulated by three types of league tables. So workers are regulated around what's called the TEF. Now that's a constant pressure from your managers and from the universities around your teaching excellent framework, which is students marking you in the National Student Survey, it is about the quality assurance. It's about the number of first class or second or upper second class degrees that you give. It's about the earnings of students when they leave that university with no recognition that at different parts of the country, they might be earning different amounts of money. It's about whether they go into professional jobs or non-professional jobs and all those things give each university a TAFE score. So they're either marked as a gold, a silver or a bronze. And they're now trying to move that down to each subject at subject level with the same pressures. And that means that each manager in each university puts huge pressure on each member of staff to make sure that their teaching is appropriate and that they get scored appropriately in those ones there. But that's only part of what university workers do. They also have something called the Research Excellence Framework, the REF, and you're appearing a, time, a, a table, a league table for that. And that's about how much uh, research you've produced, whether it's of national standing or international standing. And every piece of research that you produce is evaluated and scored and again your university your department appear on a league table and depending on where you are on that league table your university may or may not get some additional research related funding and then there's something called the KEF, which is the knowledge transfer and that's about how you take the work that you're doing and you transfer it into the community or you transfer it into business or the business sector and you also get a score around those things and in each area, what it means is that the universities are competing with each other and they're putting huge pressure on staff to improve on each of the league tables and, uh, and, and to turn over more staff. Consequence of all this is then uh, being borne out in, in what has really become a very intensified uh, industrial relations uh, picture over the last 10 years. And there's five issues that are underpinning the current action. So first of all, from that picture, what loads are massive. You have more students, you have more marking, you have more exams, you have more pressures, you have more expectations on research, of getting research contracts and fulfilling all those things. So that the amount of hours that, uh, that university staff are working is well over, on average, is well over the European threshold of 48 hours per week. Uh, people think that we have long holidays. Most people don't take their holidays. They're undertaking research and all those pressures there. Universities are different and across the university, different sectors. 
uh, they will respond in different ways. But if you're at a research intensive university, the way that you'll get your research score up is by buying yourself out. So the second issue that we have is a massive problem of casualization across the sector. It's quite uneven. Not all universities have casualized workforces, but Leeds University, for example, 67% of the staff at Leeds University are in casualized work uh, contracts uh, for very limited periods of time. Um, Linked to this, some of the issues that Cheryl and people have spoken about today, are that there are quality issues. Because if you look at those that are in casualised contracts, they are overwhelmingly from global majority populations, from women, from people with disabilities. And so there's inequalities and equalities issues around casualisation. And then there's pay erosion, because especially when they move to students funding at universities, there have been no significant pay increases now for the 12 years of austerity. And so in real terms, year on year, university workers have seen real pay cuts uh, over that 12 year period. And then the fifth issue that's shaping up is that in some of the universities, there is also an attack on pensions. There's two types of pensions in the universities. If you're in the newer universities, you're in the teacher's pension funded by like, like school teachers. But for those in the older universities, they're in what are called the university superannuation scheme. And they've seen a real fundamental attack on their pensions with lower outcomes, increased uh, subscriptions. Um, but interestingly, with the wealthier universities not paying in as much as the universities who are in the other pension scheme already pay. So five really, really significant issues which have shaped industrial action uh, this year. Uh, we're out again next week for the next three weeks uh, over a variety of those uh, issues. But uh, it's also worth saying that there are some problems in the action that's taking place. And that is that if we had gone for an aggregated ballot last uh, October, we would have had every single university across the country out on uh, strike action over what's called the four fights. That's the pay, the casualization, the workload and the qualities and over pensions. But I think it's fair to say that there was a lack of confidence in some parts of the union and uh, they wanted to make sure that some action would take place. So what happened is that we went for disaggregated ballots. And the consequence of that is that next week on pay issues, only one third of the universities will be out on questions of pay, which means that two thirds of the universities and two thirds of the employers are not going to be affected by this. So, you know, it, it's worthwhile thinking about some of the weaknesses in the dispute. And it seems to me that that comes from a, lack of confidence in the membership um, uh, that actually we should have had a national pay ballot. And if we'd had that, to re-emphasize, if we'd had that national pay ballot on an aggregated basis, we would have been out in total. So I think there's some lessons for us over the next couple of weeks. The first thing is that we need to continue with the action and we need to build the action. But the way in which it's been led by the union is it's, it's a staccato strike. So there's long gaps between the strike actions. We are isolating some union branches that are out where others are not. And we've got to try to then think about rebuilding our branch networks and having confidence in the membership for national aggregated ballots. And of course, workload is central. Casualization is key. Equalities is important. But the unifying thing here is undoubtedly pay erosion and especially just now at the time of the cost of living crisis. Um, and that affects all workers, of course. And so it's a unifying issue in the university sector, but it's also a unifying sector across all those workers that we've heard from tonight who are taking disputes and taking action. And the final thing for me to say is really that that's why I think this Saturday is a vitally important moment for us because in every People's Assembly demonstration about the cost of living crisis, we need to make sure that we have got strikers there on the demonstration, but also strikers speaking, and that we try to draw the links between the various disputes that we've heard about tonight and draw the links between those things because there's some heroic struggles going on across the country from various different workers. Uh, we've got to try and draw them together, draw the threads together, because we need a united fight back as part of, the, uh, as part of pushing them back against the cost of living crisis. Uh, a little bit of work to be done, but you, you know, if we stay strong and we stay united, I think we can win. Great. Thank you so much, Michael, and um, here's a virtual, virtual round of applause. Um, 
And yeah, I think, as you say, that confidence um, to get the, the um, aggregated ballot is helped so much by these kind of meetings where workers can hear from people who have had wins and then they have that confidence, confidence to go out. Um, as you mentioned the demos on Saturday, I'm just gonna uh, bring in Ramona from the People's Assembly, um, who's gonna um, give another shout out, I think, about um, the various demos, where they're happening, where we need to be. Um, so Ramona, are you there to, um, yeah, Hello. Um, thank you very much, Holly. Um, and thank you, Michael, you might as well have stepped in for the People's Assembly because that was a really great sort of breakdown of everything that we want to talk about in terms of the People's Assembly. And um, as you say, one of the strongest key things that we're sending across all of the groups is that there has to be a strong element of industrial struggle within all of those um, protests. So yes, I mean, I'm basically here to give a public service announcement, I guess. Um, your analysis has already been done. We all know the political context. We all know what's happening. Um, I think what I want to say is the importance of building and motivating people to make sure that the 12th on Saturday is as big as we can possibly make it. Um, probably breaking news is that the People's Assembly have just announced that this is the first wave. We don't want to go out on the streets on the 12th and say we've been on the streets on the 12th and we want to make sure that that is the first step. So we will build the pressure and we have confirmation that we will be backed by the trade unions to say that we will go ahead and go back on the streets on the 5th of March and the 2nd of April. And we will be building towards a trade union led national mobilization that will be taking place somewhere around the end of May and or the start of June. So I think that it's, yeah, this is a really important moment for us. I think that everybody here should be proud of the fact that you're part of uh, the People's Assembly and the movement that have been able to capture this moment. And, um, and that moment, and it's happening. So I think that, yeah, Saturday, we have to build as strong as possible for Saturday, take it forward two more waves, and then we build for something national. Um, I mean, I haven't seen anything quite like this in all the time that I've been in the People's Assembly working for the national um, organization. The amount of response, the anger, that's out there. It, it feels different. It really does feel kind of different. It feels like that we're expecting something that's not the usual suspects. It's it's more than that. Um, and I think that we should take that and I'd be very proud to go out and mobilize and um and start thinking about the next couple of dates going forward. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Ramona. And um yeah, I, I think there's a lot of pent up. Um, anger at the government isn't there because we haven't been able to get out on into protests and I think that um, lots of us have felt that these when they do emerge that they are going to be big and I think yeah it, more than a public service announcement saying we're going to have a demo a month until May and then a national demonstration like it's exactly what we need and that kind of political action giving support to the strikers here as well um, so yeah thank, thank you so much with this breaking news of um, um, further action uh, okay uh, so we have our last um, speaker Pete who uh, Pete Randall who is um, with the Coventry HGV refuge strikers um, they are striking over pay uh, they have managed to um, spread their strike to a nearby depot um, and uh, yeah, Pete's going to talk about um, their action in Coventry. Um, I think Pete's here. Yeah, hiya. Um, thanks for the invite. Um, thanks for uh, Jack and the, I, think, I can't remember his name, when they come to the picket line the other day showing solidarity and support, and uh, thanks for inviting me. Uh, yeah, uh, we find ourselves in, uh, I'd say, precarious uh situation but there's nothing precarious about it anymore the, uh, we're in a dispute with Coventry City Council the HGV drivers that council is a labour council okay nothing short of a disgrace 
red, allegedly, but in actual fact, they're blue. They're blue hiding in red. These people that are uh, councillors in Coventry City Council have not once come to the picket line to talk to any colleagues of mine or members that are in dispute. There's 26 of them that are members of the Unite. Okay. Now, uh, we've, we've got a, a, a quote that we're using basically on that picket line. Uh, they're Labour by name and Tory by policy. It's as simple as that. And um, we're of a belief now that if, if they want to take that stance, they either step to the plate or step aside. You know, if they don't want to represent working class people, then we need to find somebody that does want to represent these working class people. We've uh, had a dispute going on now for, uh, we're entering the second week of all that industrial action. Uh, it's our fifth week in total. Uh, we've done one four day strike, two two day strikes, but it's all our action now. We were uh, of the opinion that we're sick of the games that they're playing, trying to undermine us. Um, and we're not going to let that happen. We're not going to let that happen. Uh, our picket line at this moment in time has got up to 70 HGV uh, drivers on the picket line. And um, back in... Uh, 2019, we've been in negotiations around the rise. Obviously, the pandemic hit and made it slightly difficult to sort of uh, get, uh, let's say, dirty with the negotiations because that's what they've been doing. Um, we were working through that pandemic. We couldn't social distance. Members of the public that were working at home, clapping coming out, you know, clapping us. And at the end of the day, we were just doing our job. Uh, I've got a terminally ill wife at home. I was putting my wife's life in danger every time I went to work, okay? Now, these scumbags that sit inside that council house, one way or another, they're going to pay for it. Now, I don't care, and this is how bad it is now. I don't care. My members don't care if the Tory get in this time round, right? We hate the Tories in Coventry. Absolutely despise them. But we're going to show Labour Council and these Labour councillors a lesson. We're going to teach them something that they've never been taught before. They come for us, we're going for them, OK? We've been out this week off the picket line, obviously uh, mobilising now in the public. We've gone into the public domain, we're going out there with leaflets. We're leafleting the councillors' streets, closes, etc. And believe you me, Labour councillors, let's say, are not even known in their close of the houses that they've got 12 houses in. These people don't even know that they're a Labour councillor. And I'll tell you why they don't. Because they don't even represent that constituent to what they live in. They represent a different constituent. Now, all right, I'm all for, you know, we'll put people here to stand, etc. But when your own close of a few houses don't know that you're a local councillor within the city, it's somewhat of a, a sham, really, isn't it? Because I met an old lady in one of the closes yesterday, bless her, and she had a bag that needed to be put out at the side of a bin. I took it away and I took the time to have a conversation with her. And it, I've heard, like... Um, Somebody mentioned there about going to the streets and things like that. But this uh, this uh, little old lady, I took her back to the side of the bin and started talking to her, explaining the truths behind the industrial action. Right? These Labour councillors are manipulated and lied, no ifs or buts, lied to the public. Okay? So I told the lady, I gave her a, a leaflet with the truths on, explained the situation. The little old lady asked me to go back to her wheelie bin and bring back that bag. She says, too much background. I'm sorry, I've got my kids on the tablet. Apologies. Um, so I'll go into the other room. Uh, so basically, this little old lady asked me to take back the bag, to which uh, I did, you know. And she said, well, that bag this evening, my grandson's coming round. Me and that her grandson, she said, are going to walk to this councillor's house. She says, okay, she lives at number 44. 
says, no, I don't want to talk to her. What she now realises is that my rubbish is going to her house every day. It's time that my bag needs to go out. And this is a little old lady. If we could start getting people to think of that same sort of attitude and mannerism, imagine what we could be doing nationally. Imagine what we could be doing in each city. And it's important at this moment in time, obviously, I'm also part of the combine meetings that are taking place at United at this moment in time. And, this, you know, when we're going out, the refuse, it should be across the city, uh, across the country, sorry. You know, one, one going out and strike, yeah. But what we've seen today is that um, Solly Hall refuse services are going out for the ballot now, okay? And it's got to grow. It's got to grow. It's like the... RMT when they go out and strike in London. Why don't the London the transport go out the same week? Mm. They bring London to an absolute standstill, mm. you know. And this is the importance of a combine. Obviously, we've had the combines in the past and they've not worked to the level that they should have, but I, I believe this is different. Um, the meeting that we've just had, the online rally, is uh, wow, it's been it's been amazing. You can all go and look at it on United's page, it's on there. Sharon Graham is a breath of fresh air to unite the union. She really, really is. And in actual fact, she's just declared war on these Labour councillors. She's also notified us that Labour has been stripped of all funding from Unite the Union, not just locally in Coventry, nationally. She's pulling the plug on the funding for Labour. OK, and again, I'll go back to what I said at the beginning. Don't hide as a careerist in the Labour Party with Tory values. That's not what Labour were. Those as trade unionists, okay, comrades, brothers and sisters, created this Labour Party. It created the NHS. It created the party that created further movement, okay? These people that are in Coventry in particular, and I can certainly say a lot of them in Parliament, they're careerists. This, the careerists. I could probably count on both hands that are actually of old Labour. We're at the point now where new Labour, let's say, just in Coventry, if that's all right. Sorry. At, sorry. At this moment in time in Coventry as well, they're using scab Labour. They're breaking Regulation Seven by them bringing in a hirer of the second worker, okay, to carry out the worker of the first move. Uh, of the uh, first worker that's out on industrial action, okay? We're now going to a government body to challenge that because they've ignored the QC that's ripped to them. They've ignored the union that's ripped to them. Now, to me, if you don't reply to a letter that's been sent by a QC, there's a problem. And that problem is you've been caught out, okay? You're breaking, breaking the law and they'll be dealt with in, in the manner that they deserve. But yeah, like I say, they've come for us, we're going for them. Don't be surprised if Coventry get a majority Tory council unless we can find people from the likes of us that want to stand against them. Yeah. So, again, it's an absolute disgrace the way that Labour are going on and they need to have a long, hard look at themselves and ask who they are. And some of these people are actually employed by the PCS, yeah. you know, PCS union. So, yeah. Anyway, thank you for the... Uh, solidarity shouts and again thank you for the um invite and yeah cheers brilliant uh here's your virtual rounds of applause p and um you know i was thinking it's it's very strange doing these meetings online but your anger is kind of like bursting through the screen and i completely can understand why because um, to have a Labour council doing that to you is just like a double it's a double blow when um given the work that refuse workers do at any time but particularly during the pandemic um and then to and to have that attack from the Labour Council is as you say completely outrageous um but I will be thinking of that little old lady dumping her rubbish on doorsteps um to, to cheer me um when I'm thinking about um how absolutely useless Keir Starmer and really the lot of them are so um Pete we are certainly we are certainly with you and you'll have lots of people who agree with you I'm sure here um, so thank you so much. Um, I'm, I'm keen to get um, some, uh, I know that people are going to have some questions, maybe some contributions. Uh, we're going to aim to uh, wrap the um, meeting up by 8.30, so we'll have about 10 minutes, uh, yeah, 10, 12 minutes for questions and contributions. Um, and uh, yeah, and then uh, we'll go back to the um, strike strikers um, for any um, final comments. Um, yeah, just before we do that, I just wanted to just do a quick shout out um, that 
Um, if you are not a member of Counterfire, then please do consider joining. We are an activist organization. We brought together these um, strikers here today because um, the, uh, yeah, workers taking struggle is really at the heart of what we do. We have an amazing website um, that offers theory analysis of these strikes um, and all um, kinds of political disputes. So um, yeah, please do consider joining. It's been um, for me certainly keeping me active in the movement um, and yeah, keeping, keeping hope alive certainly as the meeting tonight definitely has done. Uh, and also sign up for the news from the Frontline Bulletin as well, which has got all of the um, rolling news about um, the strikes that are happening.